so the zero forcing linear equalizer. Uh, the input to the equalizer we call PC after the channel, and the output of the uh, equalizer then, I'll use the uh, same equation for the output of the um, equalizer, which would be the result of the convolution of the input with the taps of the filter. And what I want to do is to force this to be equal. So this is the output of the uh, equalizer. And down here I have um, what behavior I want to get from the output of my equalizer. And what I want to do is, when I'm actually detecting the symbol of interest, I want to see the symbol completely. Now, that same symbol, when it's not its time to be detected, when it falls in somebody else's time to be detected, I want its contribution to be zero. So this is the behavior I want coming out of my equalizer. So let's just write this equation, the output of my equalizer, in vector notation. It'll make it much easier for us to see what's going on. How is it that I'm going to determine what those coefficients are? So I take all of the different coefficients. I gather them together in a uh, vector. And so uh, these are the coefficients for you know, n um, symbols away from the one I want, n symbol ahead to the one I want, and the one in the middle. Uh, would represent the coefficient for the time of uh, the uh, symbol of interest. So in order to be able to write this as matrix multiplication with this vector, I'm going to construct a matrix. And the matrix that I construct in order to get this nice little equation to pop out when I do my multiplication is I, I form it like this. I say I'm going to take the channel at time, the desired time, which I reference as time zero, uh, and then I say, you know, one previous, all of, and then I line up all of the ones previous. Now I step one time later. And so now this was the one of interest, now this is T later, but everything is sort of shifted right. I'm shifting it right at each row. And at each row I'm introducing the new um, output or input to the channel, right? These are channel inputs. And so I've constructed a matrix. And the size of this matrix is just determined by the size of my, um, uh, uh, the number of taps in my equalizer. Of course, that's, that's a, a choice. And the more I have, the more, uh, the better the, the equalization will be, but also the more complex, the more delay, et cetera. So I'm going to play with my choice here. I'm not going to say what it is exactly. But now that I've constructed this matrix, I can write this matrix times this vector and what I'm going to get is a new vector, and all of these are going to be different moments of time, the output of this filter, this equalizing filter at the receiver. And so what do I want? I said that I wanted to have zero, force zero ISI. So that means that the output of my filter, I want it to look like this vector. This vector has zeros everywhere except during the desired time which is the middle one, which is my reference time of zero. Every other output of that filter is going to contribute uh, zero uh, to the other uh, symbols. Now, I can write a simple equation. I want this result of PC times A to equal this result. So this is the vector that I want to get when I multiply these two together. So that means that now I have a way of finding what are the coefficients a. So my knowledge of the channel allows me to write p of c. And from the p of c, um, if suppose I pre-multiply both sides of this equation by the inverse of the matrix pc, in that case I'm going to be left with a alone on this side. So I know what this is. It's just this sort of like impulse response vector. And if I pre-multiply by pc, I know what I want for a. So let's just write that here that the coefficients I'm looking for are just the inverse of this uh, channel matrix. And I multiply it by PQ. But what is PQ? This is just like this impulse. So just matrix multiplication, what is this going to do? This is going to be 0 everywhere except in the middle column. You know, so it means here I am at uh, PC inverse, which you know I know PC. 
and I go and I calculate the inverse of PC. And, and when I get the inverse, I get all kinds of things, with many, many columns. And then in the middle, you know, I got the middle column. And when I multiply things, these things are going to be multiplied by zero. And the only thing that's not going to be multiplied by zero is this middle column, which is why I say what we want is to have our coefficients for our filter to be just equal to the middle column of this inverse of the channel matrix that I find. So that's been a nice time domain interpretation. I've been doing convolution in the time domain, but let's think about what's going on in the frequency domain. Maybe help us get a little bit more intuition for what's happening in the zero forcing uh, equalizer. We can think of what we're doing as looking for sort of the effective impulse response. So think of it as here's the channel, and the channel has some, um, you know, h of t, and then I have some equalizer, and I'm looking for these coefficients, sort of some sort of alpha of t is my equalizer, and then these two uh, together, they're sort of like having some other effective impulse response. And that's what this is. This is what I'm trying to get. I'm trying to say that after I put these two things together, it's as if the only thing I had was a direct delta function. That the, in the end, this channel changed nothing. I put in a signal, it gives me the same signal back. This is uh, what's known as an all-pass filter, right? It just doesn't affect the channel at all. So I'm trying to find an equalizer that means when I combine these two, I'll get the same thing. Of course, this is um, concatenated filters. Uh, I would have a convolution in between the two to give me the effective one. But let's look at this delta function. This is in the time domain. What happens in the frequency domain when I have this impulse response in the time domain? Well, if I look at a nice Fourier transform uh, relationship, I know that in the frequency domain, this is a time domain, this is a nice delta function, that if I have a delta function, I'm just going to have something that's flat, completely flat um, frequency response, which is an all-pass filter. <laughs> it doesn't affect any of the frequencies. It's completely flat for all frequencies. So that's what I'm trying to accomplish here. When I wrote in equation form here, was this idea of I want the effective impulse response to be a direct delta function. And what that means is, you know, just by taking the Fourier transform relationship, is I want the result to be a flat spectrum. So what happens in the frequency domain? That means that I have in the frequency domain, I have my channel, this h of t here. And it's getting some form in the um, frequency domain. So I have some channel, which is h of f. That's this form here. Now, I'm looking for an equalizer that I'm going to put here after that. And what do I want that equalizer to do? Well, when it's all done, after I have one followed by the other, I want something that's flat. Now, in the time domain, I do convolution. But in the frequency domain, I do multiplication. So if I want this to be flat, I want it to equal 1 for all frequencies, what does that mean about what do I want for my equalizer in order for the effective to be completely flat, constant for all frequencies? Well, that means I'm looking for the inverse. I'm looking for this equalizer to just be h of f inverse. Because if it's 1 over h of f, then when I multiply together, I get 1. So this is my channel. This is my equalizer frequency response. And when I have the total effect of the two of them, I get something that's flat. That's why when I first described the zero forcing equalizer, I didn't say, well, I said the name it forces the ISI component to be zero. But often we hear the description of the zero forcing equalizer as being the one that inverts the channel. So here's an example of, in yellow, the frequency response of the channel. 
And in green is when I take this frequency response and I look for the inverse. And if we look at this uh, frequency response, um, we can see that when the uh, channel is low, the equalizer is high. When the channel is high, the equalizer is low. Just makes it for the inverse. Let's take an example. Okay, so let's look at this particular multipath channel. In this case, I have uh, seven components, which I've listed here. This is the channel knowledge that is required to do this equalizer, the zero forcing equalizer. So these, uh, this is a plot of it. Now, let's just talk about complexity for the zero forcing equalizer uh, compared to, well, then we have to compare. What is the complexity of it? Um, it's, it's a fungible complexity because I can choose how many taps are in it. So it may be that the optimal, you know, maybe it's, you know, it's got to have a really, really lot of, of taps in order to actually achieve that inverse. Um, but um, I could reduce the complexity and just use fewer taps. That, that's going to cost me something. And what it costs me is performance is going to be deteriorated. So complexity is not, like, completely determined. You know, there's some way I can play with it. For instance, if I were going to look at... Um, this multipath return, I could think of it in terms of some of these are really small and they won't matter so much. Uh, so, so that's some way that I can play with the complexity in this example. And in fact, in this example, we're only going to use three taps in our equalizer to try and equalize the intersymbol interference, even though there are seven taps, seven uh, taps in this, in this uh, channel.